Thank you very much for coming here today. And we are at a very crucial juncture in the National Health Service. The hospitals are overstretched, so are general practices. And never, ever have I been trying so hard to put square posts in round holes. Okay. So that's our daily activity now. So it is at this moment that we come and we have to look at the whole health care budget as a single one and not think about the divide between the primary care and the secondary care because what happens in primary care impacts secondary care in a huge way and how your local hospital works impacts the primary care in an equal way. So this is what we have tried to do in our local services to give you a brief overview of how we have tried to improve the AF services in our local area. But it's all about building bridges between the primary and secondary care. But before we go into that, let us look at the impact of AF. As you can see, you are not exempt. And many of the people here today are already at a risk of developing atrial fibrillation. One in four will develop it if you're above 40 years. And should you develop AF, there is a five times greater chance of stroke than if you did not develop AF. And if you had AF and had a stroke, you have a 30% more chance of dying within the first 30 days than people who have stroke without AF. And if we did things properly, then 7,000 deaths, our AFs-related strokes, not deaths, can be prevented annually. Equally, you know, Lancashire Teaching Hospital is in focus nowadays. This is the impact on hospital admissions for AF. In the last 15 years, 47% increase in hospital admissions. And at least one in five patients have got atrial fibrillation. Not only that, if they are admitted to the hospital and have AF, <coughs> their length of stay, something which we have to focus very closely on, is seven and a half days more if they didn't have atrial fibrillation. This is national data. So we should do everything which is within our limits to control and treat AF. So it has been our mission to try and see if locally we could promote GPs through their enhanced services, looking at the initiation of NOACs as well as to look at warfarin therapy <coughs> in patients who have AF. Because we know that it is crucial to anticoagulate some patients with AF. Shuja has already alluded to the importance of anticoagulation in AF and how you can prevent it. So we will look at how we can help the local practices as well as the patients themselves with the aid of different organizations such as the academic network to identify and treat patients with atrial fibrillation. Now this is the national percentage of people who are admitted with a stroke and who should be on anticoagulation. And from this graph you will see that many of them are really on antiplatelets. Now they should have all been, or most of them should have been, unless contraindicated on anticoagulation. But you see only a small chunk is on anticoagulation. And some of them are inappropriately on antiplatelets, no medication, as well as anticoagulant. So this reflects what we see nationally. This is a national audit. So lots of people are not on it. And not only that, now, there are a chunk of patients who are on anticoagulants here, but it is not enough to give a medication and think it has worked. So we have to measure its efficacy. Otherwise, you will be lulled into a false sense of security. And how do we measure that? Time in therapeutic range. So if people are on warfarin, they must be within their therapeutic range 65% of the time. And if they're not in their therapeutic range two-thirds of the time, then we are doing them a disservice by giving them warfarin and then looking away. So we looked at why? Because if you improve the target in therapeutic range only by 10%, then you will reduce the risk of stroke by 20%. And that's the rely data, which we heard just now. So time in therapeutic range is crucial. 
and we looked at an audit in Lancashire Teaching Hospital. So great service from Lancashire Teaching Hospital, very good anticoagulation department, anticoagulating patients on AF, monitoring their INR, how are we doing with our target in therapeutic range? And you will see, we looked at so many people and only 36% uh, had their therapeutic range, 61% had their uh, therapeutic range in the right range, but 36% did not, despite the services of an anticoagulation service led by two consultants and a very able team of anticoagulant nurses, 33% did not achieve their therapeutic range. So imagine what might happen to the stretched, overstretched GP practices who are trying to run enhanced services. I'm sure it's better, isn't it? So warfarin, 1920s, an era of Great Depression in America. Cattle were dying willy-nilly. Why? Because they were being fed on moldy hay. The farmers were so poor that they could not feed their cattle on fresh hay. And they developed hemorrhagic disease and were dying till in 1922, one farmer couldn't take it anymore. So he took his dead bull at the back of his truck and a jar of unclotted blood and then drove 200 miles into Wisconsin. The Wisconsin and then al uh, the alumni in Wisconsin, two people were doing research there in the dead of the night and he barged into their room and demanded an explanation as to why his cows were dying. And thereafter came the research, and warfarin was discovered, and this is how the name comes. Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, the first four. It was then developed into a rodenticide, and then it was released unto human beings. But it has got its disadvantages. It has got its disadvantages in terms of its interaction with many medications, drugs, need for frequent monitoring, and us not being able to get to a therapeutic INR and to date not being able to predict who will get the therapeutic INR. We've got the gene testing that might help us to predict, but to date we are not using them. So there was a big hiatus and then came in the newer anticoagulants. No need for monitoring, well, no need for standard monitoring, quick action, very little interaction with other medications. and very convenient for certain patients. So with this background, the NOACs, the three that has been mentioned, came into uh, the field with, in quick succession. And there has been a steady increase. And in Shuja's practice, as he has said, he has not prescribed warfarin for a long time. I let the Liverpool CCG know. <laughs> <laughs> and on the heels of this came the European Cardiac Society recommendation honed on the scientific anvil of science, big trials looking at thousands and thousands of patients, 50,000 patients in total, trying to see if warfarin is better or a NOAC is better. And therein came the recommendation, which we don't have time to go through, but this is warfarin and this is NOAC. NOACs get a solid arrow, warfarin gets a dotted arrow. So the choice in this group is anticoagulation a group gets a solid arrow and this gets a dotted arrow. There is some message to be conveyed in that. NOACs are better. They are better at stroke prevention. Forget about the other conveniences. NOACs are better at stroke prevention than warfarin. But they are more expensive and naturally we have to look at that costs issue. It is not to say that there won't be any patients who will not be candidates for warfarin. Even in this day and age when NOACs are around, there will still be candidates for warfarin. But who are the candidates for NOACs? Patients who cannot achieve a TTR on warfarin. We have said 65%. So we have already seen how the TTRs can be looked at. Either you can use a software to save the TTR is 65%, or you can look at the yellow book and say, depending on what the INR levels are. And there are figures to look at that. Some people will have difficulty in a hardship. They're perpetually on a cruise. 
And they have no way of monitoring INRs. Of course, you can do self-monitoring, which is endorsed. But they might wish to go on warfarin. Some are intolerant or tired of warfarin. Couldn't take it anymore. Couldn't take my grandma for warfarin therapy. Some have got renal dysfunction, where the NOAX would be difficult to give. Of course, you need to have very good history of medical compliance. Because as I say, warfarin can be monitored. And what cannot be monitored cannot be measured. No acts cannot be monitored because they can't be measured. So you have to depend on the compliance of the patient to say that they are diligently taking this medication. And in a non-compliant patient, it is not a good idea because you cannot monitor it. And possibly for some of the new patients, isn't it? Or all of the new patients. But there are optimal candidates for warfarin. The other side of the coin, people who have renal insufficiency. Okay. People who do not find the testing burdensome, people who want that I want my monitored, I want full control of my life uh, and others' lives as well, like my wife might say, have access to self-testing machine, those who can have that, and who are concerned about the lack of evidence of reversal. Now, reversal is a big issue. You, well, you cannot reverse the newer anticoagulants. There is a new drug which may be available. We don't know that yet but we can reverse warfarin. Though the fact of the matter is, when a stroke occurs with warfarin, no matter how quickly you reverse it with vitamin K antagonists, the stroke is devastating. It's much bigger than the strokes that have appeared on with NOAC. So if you have a stroke on a patient with NOAC, the strokes are more contained. Strokes are limited, but those on warfarin strokes are bigger. Why? Because warfarin alters the vitamin K dependent factors and one of them is very predominant and widespread in the meninges and that's why the stroke is bigger but the NOACs do not work on the vitamin K dependent factors hence the stroke is smaller so most of it is based the way the GP practices and the advice line that I have for them which is which I'm going to come to for that um, is the EHRA based recommendations. They have published a very comprehensive guidance to say how GPs and probably possibly pharmacists in the future may help with this can come up with a strategy in their practice to initiate the NOACs with confidence and follow these patients up so that that 47% increase in hospital admissions can be avoided. You may refer less and less to the hospital. So what, is this, what are the steps? The steps are first decide that anticoagulation is needed. So you do a CHADS VAS score, everybody has access to it. And we know if the CHADS VAS score is above a certain limit, we start anticoagulation. Then you decide whether you're going to do a NOAC or you're going to do a warfarin. So if you decide, then decide on the NOAC, which NOAC you need. You've got three choices here. Then you do some baseline tests and decide whether you're going to give a proton pump inhibitor to protect your stomach. Provide education to the patient, telling them that though these drugs are not similar to warfarin, they have the same effects as warfarin in terms of bleeding. Hand out an anticoagulation cards. Several are available online as well as through different drug companies. Organize a follow-up. And then we'll look at who can follow up. It doesn't even have to be the general practitioner doctor who can follow up. So at initiation, we have looked at these. Then follow up is one monthly and then three monthly. Very easy. And then do you check the adherence, count the medication if needed, or ask them, check for thromboembolism, adverse effects, etc. Com complain the, uh, complete the alert card. And then annual UNE testing which is very easy and even clinical physiologists or nurses can deliver this. This is very easy and well documented. So you detect AF through an ECG reliably, then you do some initiation things and then you follow them up. Lends itself extremely well to non-doctor follow-ups. So what are the supports for GPs that we have had locally? So I've got the happy hour. Um, any GP can ring me from my area between a certain time, and I'll not mention that over here. 
um, they can man uh, it's well well promoted they can ring me and I'll be at the end of the phone to advise them about anything doesn't have to be my patients okay and the majority of the calls that I've had so far have been on should I initiate a NOAC in this patient or should I not so this is the sort of support the initial say so I want all their calls have been I want to initiate this patient on this drug NOAC so what should I do? Shall I? Shall I not? So it's just that initial impediment, the hesitation that needs to be overcome and a little bit of advice on the phone. Yes, go ahead. And that does it all. Supporting networks are also there. The supporting networks like uh, the supporting network we have here today, there's the Atrial Fibrillation Association, Heartbeat Locally, the innumerable supporting networks. Pharmacy support. So some GPs have actually called in pharmacists into their surgery and looked through their practice AF registers and identified people who need to be on anticoagulation now. And the, with, in conjunction with the pharmacists, they have come up with the conclusion that no acts need to be started or anticoagulation needs to be started. There they get stuck. Shall I start it? Shall I refer to the hospital? Now with the uh, support services, I think they can. And you, all GP practices need to do this because the NICE guidelines have changed. So somehow they need to identify which patients are languishing in their register who need to be on anticoagulation. And then we have got GP educational programs like this, evening ones, afternoon ones, all promoting the, uh, the treatment of atrial fibrillation. And then we have got outreach services as well. So some companies have come up, independent companies have come up to say that we will go into a GP practice, we will identify all the patients with AF, would you please join us in seeing these patients? So they have come up. So independent business companies have sprung up, third parties, who are offering this to stroke physicians and cardiologists in the country and locally in your neck of the woods. I haven't joined yet, one yet because I think this can be done without but it, there is a lot of pressure to do it from the GPs. So this is one example of an anticoagulation card. So you just write down, it's like any other card, but it's available on the internet through the EHRA. And then there are technological aids. We have talked about medication boxes, smartphone apps. You've said about smartphone apps. And the smartphone I'm increasingly using for patients to measure their pulses. You can download an app to do that. So these are the common questions that I get from the GPs. There's no time to go through all these questions, but if we do have a panel discussion at the end, we will answer them. Should I initiate? What will I do if a patient rings to say, I forgot to take my medication this morning? What shall I do now? How will I manage if the patient is bleeding? What should I do if they develop renal dysfunction? For example, an elderly lady, all it takes is a bout of diarrhea for the creatinine clearance to fall and then you go into the difficult range. Stopping and reinitiation. My patient's going for tooth extraction tomorrow, or I have to remove a mole from the back. Patient is on a NOAC, what shall I do? These are the common questions. And some people uh, want to switch off from warfarin to a NOAC. How do I do that? Patient is not wanting warfarin anymore, but he's already anticoagulated. How do I switch to another anticoagulant? Or how do I move into the dark side of the world, switching from a NOAC to warfarin in some patients? Okay, so these are the questions that we answer, and we will be able to answer if you have any. So in life, we are faced with two choices, really. One is to do less, to have less, to share less, and this sorts of a choice leads to a life of constant apprehension. And then we have got the other choice, to do more than we can, to share more than we can, to give it all that we can. And this is a life that leads to one of wondrous anticipation. And on that note, I'll end this talk. Thank you.